Welcome to our imaging conference. Today we have a, a yearly topic on contrast echo. So see what's new, what's different. Not much is new and different, but believe it or not, when I go and lecture on contrast echo and I ask people how many, how many uh, are familiar with contrast, how many use contrast, it's still a minority, and that bothers me. Not that we're here, we're um, advocating for contrast, we're advocating for appropriate contrast use, because this is a drug that can enhance what we see and improve your accuracy of interpretation where it is needed. And uh, let's hope that we can actually put things in perspective today of where is contrast, what are the agents, what are the pros and the cons, where can we use them. And I would start usually with first with the conventional agitated saline contrast because it still has, and it definitely has, Fred, you can come closer. Um, it still has a place in cardiology. And the reason for it is because these tiny micro bubbles that either you generate through micro cavitation by just agitating saline or agitating anything. People say if you agitate a little more blood actually with the saline that it makes you know, bigger bubbles, etc. However, by intrinsic properties as well as when these bubbles go to the pulmonary circulation, they don't last as long, and actually most of them will get absorbed and destroyed, and therefore, ideally, you should not get any contrast coming to the left side. And that's the beauty of saline contrast. The bubbles are larger, on the average about 10 microns, still small, but larger compared to the newer ones, and therefore, that's part of the reason. And what's in there, it's air, as opposed to any other uh, gas that you're talking about. So this is a nice premium atrial septal defect with a big right ventricle, et cetera, et cetera, telling you about shunting. Okay? And at the same time, also, an agitated saline can enhance your tricuspid regurgitation jet, particularly when you're thinking of if pulmonary artery pressures are important to calculate or estimate, I think this is one way to do that. You don't have to go to the more expensive um, you know, contrast agents. So saline contrast can do. And believe it or not, although you may not be impressed with the tricuspid regurgitation jet, it may be just few red cells, you can enhance them significantly so that you can end up with a TR jet from which you can estimate what the pulmonary pressures are. So all what we're talking about here is that these tiny micro bubbles, either generated through agitation or manufactured to basically scatter ultrasound. That's what they do. Remember from our first lecture and talking about ultrasound these ways, when, when they hit these tiny micro bubbles, they have energy. So that energy vibrates the tiny micro bubble, and it depends what the property of that micro bubble is, what is the shell like, which is in green, what is the gas like, what's the half-life of this tiny micro bubble, right? And what's the frequency from which you're sending? So all these interactions occur to provide this beautiful contrast and how long does the contrast last and how intense the contrast is, right? So we need to know all these intricacies, and I know this is not a novel audience. So we're going to interact and talk and ask questions about that because I think this is very important. Now, this lab has been involved in contrast since pretty much an inception. When I was a fellow, believe it or not, we started some of the contrast work. And... Uh, you know, we did animal work, we did in vitro work, we did clinical studies, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened in the field, the field was, was amazing because we knew that you're going to be able to have, you know, echo density coming out from contrast. So people worked for many, many years, billions of dollars invested 
to try to put together contrast bubbles that are robust enough, that may not be destroyed that much, that last longer, and also traverse the pulmonary circulation so you can start seeing things on the left side with the hope of not only opacifying the left ventricle, but also trying to opacify the myocardium so you can get an agent that can give you something about blood flow, viability, myocardial blood flow, myocardial you know, uh, flow reserve, etc. cetera. Hmm? So that's the field. So what you see there is a depiction, I know we spent quite a bit of time on it, is the air or the gas in it is air if you're just doing microcavitation agitation, but people have experimented with many high molecular weight gas that is much more inert, safe, obviously. And the shell can be formed of many, many different uh, phospholipids, surfactants, other things that that can give it more robustness, believe it or not, will be harder to destroy. And, uh, and this is what we ended up at this stage of the game. So in 2017, in yellow are the ones that are approved for use in the United States. The first three, and there is a little gap, the first three are actually clinically used nowadays in the United States. The first one started with Optison and then Definity and then Lumison, which is the latest one. We worked with all of them, and even we worked with Imogen, and Cardiosphere, and Imagify. <laughs> the one in green is approved in outside the United States. The ones in white uh, have not uh, seen the birth of approval, because although they were quite a bit promising, uh, never uh, were pushed enough to, for approval. So, but the bottom line is that at least we have three agents, and we have the three agents actually in our laboratory uh, with very solid properties. You could see that the size of the micro bubble is between one and basically four or so, and that's an average, right? Vast majority are somewhere in, the, in between. The shell composition could be albumin, phospholipid, lipids, surfactants, and the gases are not air. They're usually perfluorocarbon something like this, inert, safe, and you know, it depends on these properties. It gives you some half-life for it to be able to circulate in the body, actually inject it in the vein, it goes and goes to the left side, and then also recirculates and comes back, okay? So this is what's available now. And the beauty of these agents, the newer ones, obviously, are that they can traverse to the left side and makes something that is uninterpretable, just like you're seeing right now, into an interpretable examination. I mean, that's the beauty. And this is from our early studies, believe it or not. These were, I can't remember the date, but certainly 10 plus years ago, that the field was amazing. And, but you won't be able to use maximum advantage unless you understand what is going on because it is not like an injection of contrast in the catheterization laboratory where all what you're wondering about is how, much, how many cc's are you giving and how rapid, you know, how big the chamber is. Interestingly enough is that these contrast agents interact <laughs> with the settings of the ultrasound. They're sensitive. They're very fragile. So unless you know what energy you're sending, you can destroy them. At times, you may want to destroy them for a reason, but for the sake of discussion today and for clinically uh, uh, appropriate indications, the appropriate indication for contrast now is non-visualization of the myocardium. Two or more segments, and I think that has been panned out, that your interpretation of ventricular function and wall motion goes downhill the more, uh, the more absent visualization two or more, three, just imagine what happens if you have half of the heart not seen, right? So that's the appropriate indication for them. Now, let's go through this. Don't look at the picture. If I have an incredible number of bubbles that are so concentrated and they reflect so much ultrasound, if they are so concentrated, it's almost like a highly reflectant object or medium, right? It's almost like calcium 
or metal, right? So if it is incredibly concentrated, it's going to shadow behind it. If ultrasound is coming from here, it's going to shadow behind it. I'm not going to be able to see. If it's a decent concentration, I can see through. It fills in my cavity, and all is good. If the concentration is too poor, I'm going to have some of these micro bubbles in addition to black where you, know, you have blood. So your challenge is, am I dealing, you're as a sonographer and as a physician, am I dealing with a good concentration so my interpretation is good, okay? And if I don't see well, why not, <laughs> right? Is it too much? Is it too little? Are my settings different? And this is, this is part of the learning curve today. And I know most of you have been exposed, so it's not a completely strange situation. Now, when you inject, and most, I think, agents, although if you look at the actual package insert, doesn't tell you to dilute it with a certain number, but most places in the country and beyond dilute these contrast agents to about 10 cc or so to make the bolus of a not too concentrated to give you too much attenuation. And you usually inject it slowly, maybe a cc at a time, depending what the situation is. And then obviously see what the heart is looking like. Is it too much or is it too little? And then titrate it and top it off gradually over time. What you would expect on the first injection, and this is, I'm going to show you a bolus injection that is rather rapid, non-diluted. And what you're going to see is on the, uh, let's see here. I'm going to turn on my sophisticated pointer, laser pointer right there. What you're going to see first, the, the right ventricle is here, believe it or not. What you're going to see is you're not going to see the right ventricle. You're going to see a sliver of contrast. And the reason why you see a sliver of contrast, although it's filling the whole right ventricle, is you have attenuation. Why? Because the ultrasound is coming this way, right? These are, the, these are the scan lines. And the first thing they're hitting is this contrast just after the septum. <clears throat> so what you're going to see is just a sliver of white, attenuation behind it, because I'm not seeing much of the right ventricle because it's so concentrated. It's going to go into the pulmonary circulation, come back to the left atrium, start filling the left atrium, left ventricle, Early on, diluted, a little stronger, much stronger, and then ultimately a lot of shadowing behind it till the bolus kind of goes away. Okay, so let's demonstrate that. Let's see how we're going to demonstrate that. There you go. All right, so contrast is in, believe it or not. On the I don't see the right ventricle. Now I'm seeing more and more the left ventricle. And watch, right? It's filling nicely. And now you have this black thing here. It's not because of lack of contrast. It's because the concentration of contrast is so much. Do you understand that? This is a very important principle for sonographers, physicians, whatever it is. Where were you, doctor? Dr. Cassie, yes indeed. It is, the reason why you have blackness here is almost like if you put a metal sheet right here. The concentration of contrast is so high that it's reflecting all the ultrasound back. Nothing penetrates. I cannot see if I cannot penetrate with ultrasound for it to be reflected to come back, right? We got it. OK. But this is very important, because then you understand if it is too much or too little. If I'm seeing this, usually concentration here is quite white, and behind it is black. What you can do is just wait a little bit. I said, oops, I've done a little too much contrast. Uh, wait a little bit. You can destroy it a little more with ultrasound. Excuse me, or just wait a little bit for it to diffuse, dilute, so it's, this bolus is not coming in all at the same time. That's why we dilute it, and that's why you inject it over like three seconds or four seconds or whatever. It is slow, so it, it mixes with the blood that's going on 
and with the, with the saline infusion. Now, I mentioned to you that we have to understand the energy that is transmitted from ultrasound because these micro bubbles are fragile. They are fragile. Now, you've heard about the mechanical index. Now, if you remember the first lecture on physics of ultrasound, you have many knobs on this airplane, right? Many knobs. There's only one knob that changes the amount of power that you're sending into the patient and to the body. And that's the mechanical index. All the others are post-processing, meaning the ultrasound has reflected, and I want to you know, decrease the gain, adjust my time gain compensation, have a more reject, have a more compress. All of this is post-processing. Post-processing. Mechanical index is actually the power that you're sending through the transducer to the body. Now, ultrasound, for medical purposes, is regulated so that you won't harm patients, right? But you know that you could have ultrasound energy that is so high that you could break gallstones and you could break renal stones. And you could concentrate it in a way that it can be delivered to the place that you want it with an incredibly high energy. So this mechanical index, you cannot go beyond a certain mechanical index because this is what ultrasound regulation is about. Okay? So what is it? Is it a peak negative pressure divided by the, ratio, by the square root of frequency? And if you remember that ultrasound is pulses of wavelength. There could be two, three packets that go together. You don't, you don't send it all the time because otherwise you won't know where the depth is. You remember, you rem you're, you're hoping to reflect some of that to come back and distance is time, is all time related. That's how I know what distance is because I know what time it took. So this packet of ultrasound that you see has a positive pressure and a negative pressure. In this little tiny micro bubble, positive pressure will compress it and the negative pressure will expand it. So you know, and this is, we're talking about fractions of milliseconds, but the ones that hurts the most for the bubble is the negative pressure because I can compress it and I'm not gonna destroy it. But if you expand it, just like you're blowing up a balloon, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna burst the balloon, okay? So this mechanical index, by having a high mechanical index, will basically destroy quite a few of these micro bubbles. So unless you figure out the setting on your machine, I can inject as much contrast and you're gonna have quite a bit of destruction. Still new contrast will come in, I'm gonna destroy quite a bit and it's gonna look like a hurricane <laughs> because it's mixture of new contrast coming with you know, destroyed contrast. Now, what numbers are we talking about? <clears throat> this is, you know, th this was really hot, I would say, 15, 20 years ago. Very hot. Because the scientists, as well as ultrasound manufacturers, as opposed to industry, trying to get into the bubble technology, trying to understand all this, you know, which is a quite a dynamic situation. Most of the time, for regular imaging, forget about contrast, we live here with a mechanical index close to 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, something like this, okay? Now, people started saying, well, hmm, I want to save more contrast, so I'm coming down on the power, I'm coming down on the, on the MI to a point where, remember, imaging may not be as, as good, as strong, because you're sending much less energy, but if you put contrast, you're gonna be able to see more and more, and this is low power, so a mechanical index of about 0.3, Point four doesn't destroy as much bubbles and then you still have a good response from them. So if you see yourself, if sonographer, you know, makes a mistake and stays at a high mechanical index, uh, my eye is not always on the mechanical index, but my eye is on the echocardiogram. And if I see contrast that is funny, that is not filling the whole heart smoothly, I always look there and see 
what kind of setting is somebody using. So hopefully the sonographers are in tuned into this at this stage of the game to know what to do and what not to do. So, so number one is know your mechanical index, know your settings on the, on the machine itself so that you're using an appropriate mechanical index. For most visualizations currently, the mechanical index with contrast should be low, 0.5 or below. 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, or something like this, so that you don't destroy as much, okay? Let's take a look at some examples here. So this is a, an experiment in a patient that you will see what the effect of mechanical index, this is 1.5 here, which is on the high end, and I'm injecting contrast. So I want you to see what happens at the high mechanical index, and once we bring it down, Okay, let your eye float between 1.5 and the cavity, and you're gonna see this coming down over time and notice what happens. So this is the same patient, same injection of contrast coming in, that how smooth it becomes when your mechanical index is low. All right, so let's play it. High mechanical index, see how it is? A lot of destruction, particularly close to the apex. I'm going to start coming down. There you go, point something, whatever it is. Watch. Fills it very nicely. We'll do it again. There you go, high mechanical index. Lower, watch. It fills all the way to the apex very nicely. And this is almost instantaneous. Okay? Now, you could say to yourself, let's see if I can... Let's see how can I stop this baby here one more time. One more time. I wanted to make a case for you. Here you go. How do I know that I didn't use too little of contrast? How do I know? You see here, it's not filling, right? See this, how poor contrast is? How do I know that, do I need more contrast to inject in this heart? Yes or no? How do I know that? The bottom half is, is full of contrast. So this contrast is coming in as being destroyed closer to the apex because you're closer to the apex, the higher the energy it is, right? So I know you know, my concentration here is incredible, but my destruction is here. And believe it or not, it's rather typical. If you see this hurricane-like situation with good contrast coming in, good contrast, you know you're dealing, you always look for the mechanical index and make sure that, you know, this is not the situation, okay? And we'll give you some real life examples here. And these are from situations where we don't like the sonographer to do such a thing, but it was done, right? So it's not like, look at this beauty. You have the whole phenomena, right? What do you have? You have hurricane-like with, you know, breaking down of this. And what do you have here? What is this? This is attenuation. So the sonographer and the nurse were pushing more and more contrast because the apex is not showing well, right? Yet you know you have so much attenuation here that you have tremendous amount of contrast all the way up to here. But from here on, you're having so much destruction. No matter how much contrast you're gonna give, not gonna happen, right? All what you need to do is come down on the mechanical index and the mechanical index was 1.1. Got it? Okay, so number one, mechanical index knowledge. Higher mechanical index, you're gonna destroy. You're gonna go on the lower mechanical index. And most of these contrast settings are already there. Number two is that in most of these machines, except maybe one, is the need to use harmonic, and why? Harmonic imaging is very interesting. 
because actually it was pushed to be developed for contrast. And part of the reason is that these tiny little micro bubbles, when you hit them with, with a ultrasound wave, they vibrate. And when they vibrate, they emit similar, what's called fundamental frequency. This is, this is the initial frequency of this transducer. But they also emit multiple of this, meaning two times the frequency, three times the frequency, or even half of that frequency. This is ultra-halvonic, okay? And this is harmonic. I'll give you an example. If you take... Uh, if you take a string, if you're a piano player or a guitar player, you can hit the string nicely, and you'll hear the its fundamental frequency. Ping! No interference. It's exactly the same one. But try to deform it a little more. All right? Hit it very hard. Okay? You will have the fundamental frequency and multiples of it. These multiples are at a lower amplitude, lower amplitude, but they're multiple. So that almost you here, I'm gonna simulate here. Right? So you'll have multiples of them, either in the subharmonic and the high harmonic. And people have tried to use subharmonic, believe it or not, for imaging. And what has stuck the most is is harmonic imaging of the first harmonic, not the second harmonic, right? So this is the first harmonic, or two times the frequency. And so hmm, you say, well, if these tiny micro bubbles are emitting so much second frequency, maybe if I image in harmonic as opposed to fundamental, meaning if I image, if I send, let's say, 2.5 megahertz transducer, and I listen at 2.5, that's my, my fundamental. If I send at 2.5 and listen at 5 megahertz, maybe I'll increase the signal from these tiny micro bubbles. And indeed, that's what happens. Okay? So let's go through this. Hmm? This is the same case. All what we're changing is imaging from fundamental to harmonic. So continuous. Just a flip of harmonic, okay? And let's take a look at uh, the thing here. The mechanical index is high, all right? But, uh, here you go. 3.5 megahertz. And if you see an H, it will be harmonic, 3.5 megahertz. Meaning, um, sending at 1.25 or 1.75, whatever it is, and, and imaging at 3.5. Okay? And let's see what, what it looks like. First, I'll, I'll, I won't bias you. You'll see it with your eyes. Is This is fundamental imaging. What you're seeing there, contrast is already there. And it's almost like myocardium. I can't tell the difference. Right? The images are really not pretty. But once you put harmonic on, I'm emphasizing the little resonance from these tiny micro bubbles, the signal from harmonic just goes up significantly compared to muscle. Okay? Let's see it. Harmonic, not harmonic, fundamental. Harmonic. Fundamental. Harmonic. Quite a difference. Yes, Jeff. Yes. Indeed. Okay, a very important question from Jeff is, I mean, everything is, is sending back something, right? And why, if I put harmonic, I see much more contrast than I see myocardium. And that's the beauty of it, actually. Believe it or not, harmonic imaging came on board because of contrast. Interestingly enough is that nowadays, Actually, most sonographers and most everybody uses harmonic to see 
myocardium because initially we thought myocardium is not going to emit any second harmonics. And actually myocardium does emit second harmonics with, if you remember the first lecture, with some caveats and good things. It takes away reverberations. It takes away clutter from particularly close to the apex, and that's why you see it. There's one downside to harmonic imaging is that your resolution is lower, right? So if I'm imaging at 3.5 or 3 megahertz, I'm sending the initial frequency is 1.5, which gives me a lower resolution, right? So things may look thickened, may, may look uh, you know, less, less sharp, if you will. But yes, to answer your question, indeed, the micro bubbles are emitting much more resonance and second harmonic compared to myocardium. And that's why you see this major difference right there. OK? Very important. If you tell me the truth, this, uh, we could stop right here. We could stop right here because the major message to you is know that your ultrasound machine settings interfere with your imaging. Two, need to know mechanical index and harmonic, whether this is the setting that you're dealing with. And if you have too much destruction, you may want to lower down your mechanical index so you don't have as much destruction, right? So let's go a few things, I think, I think to, to solidify what we're talking about. And the first one on the left is actually the clinical indication currently in the United States for contrast, is improving endocardial border definition, particularly if you have two or more segments uh, that are. Enhancement of Doppler signal is not your indication, although we do it. Myocardial perfusion, still out there, and we can talk briefly about it, but I think you need to know because, you know, we've done a lot of work on it before. Therapeutics, believe it or not, uh, thrombolysis, enhanced with contrast and, and ultrasound. Uh, a great review that is still, I would say, current from the American Society of Echocardiography as to the applications of contrast. This is for you to go and take a look at. It's, it's beyond the clinical indication for contrast and whatever we could do with it. Uh, these are the clinical applications of what we use. Number one, certainly improved endocardial bore definition for regional and global function. Delineation of hypertrophy, and these are you know, fewer things now, obviously. You rescue on the interpretable studies. Stress echocardiography, it is used, but it is not yet approved for that indication. There is one company that is working on that now and undergoing a study, although you will see quite a few studies, including from this institution, telling us what it is like. And uh, let's go through some cases. And some of you may have seen this before, but I'll just, here you go. So, a show of hand, how many think this is normal function? I don't have any hands? Oh, come on. First image doesn't look like, but I gave you more. <laughs> Can Cannot tell, I mean, you, you're so hesitant. I mean, if, if you're stranded on an island and uh, somebody asks you, uh, what's my heart function, and you see this, what do you tell them? No? You need a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the island. I love that. <laughs> All right. How many think it's a uh, bad function? Oh, God. It's reduced. I mean, really, nobody has an opinion except uh, Dr. Cassie. I'll go with bad. Uh, you go with bad, three bads, three bads, three bads. Okay, come on. Contrast may help you. All right. Well, let's see if it helps you. What do you think? Dr. Cassie? Dr. Cassie, maybe another day in Vegas, it, it would be better for you. <laughs> All right, how about this one? This is reduced. So how do you read it? That's how you write, looks big. 
Okay, it's it's depressed ventricle, enlarged. Uh, how about can you tell me something about regional function? I mean, there's some regional abnormality here. See, see this? Yeah, I mean, some regional abnormalities here. But I mean, there are a lot I can't see. Correct? Okay. That's the same patient. Would that change your management? Okay. Sounds good. Um, what's this? Can you give me a diagnosis here? Huh? Pseudoaneurysm? Possible? Carlos, what do you think? Hocum with an apical aneurysm. Okay. Possibly as a patient of Dr. Nagy. Okay, Dr. Naga. Dr. Naga, this is your patient, Dr. Naga. I hope uh, we can, I hope it's moving. <laughs> it's not moving. Uh, let's see here, hold on one second. There you go. Your, your aneurysm is gone. Epic, yeah, actually it's HCM, uh, your garden variety septal hypertrophy. Huh? That's your garden variety septal hypertrophy. Okay. This case I always show because uh, that one tricked me real bad. And these are the best pictures. I mean, th this was during videotape days, so this is more than 10 years old. Hmm? It's like 15 years old. A contrast was available, but uh, things were on a videotape, so we had to digitize this, okay? And basically, you know, Dr. Kleiman, I remember that day, he said, this guy has a horrible EKG, I and mean, he can't have a normal heart. He said, okay, Dr. Kleiman, we're going to bring him back to the lab and use contrast. And indeed, that's what we did. And watch what he had. Look at this. Hmm? It is quite impressive, huh? And it is in an area where your eye kind of draws the conclusion without you seeing it. And this is, this is your two-chamber view. Hmm? It was actually a true aneurysm in a very unusual situation, not a pseudoaneurysm, okay? Uh, this one we did live. It was a live case in Washington, D.C. Patient came in the night before with chest pain and that's what you see on the EKG. And this is the echocardiogram. So the live audience was there. What do you guys think? So you just like have a live audience here. What do you think? Apical infarct? Huh? There's hypokinesis of the apex and it you know, I mean, you know, it goes along with the EKG, but the EKG may be more impressive than what it is. I just don't know, right? Message here is, if you don't know, you'd better get something to help you. And indeed, look at that. Hmm? That's an apical hypertrophy. Okay? All right. I want to help me out with these guys here. This is a patient. I want your interpretation. Inferior wall is akinetic. How about the other areas? Okay to you? Slightly hypo. Okay. You want to know? You want to know what it looks like? Okay. You want to know what it looks like? Oh, light. Tyree, can we, we do anything with the light? But watch. Hmm? Apical thrombus on top of this apical abnormality. So you missed two out of the three. 
And again, it tells you the situation is if we're not seeing, you can't interpret. No, no, you can turn it off. I think it's good. I, I don't mind it. Is that okay, uh, Tyree? Yep. Uh, but, but you could see what I'm talking about here is uh, right there. How about this case? What do you think? I'm sorry? Guys, uh, you need to know this one. All right? I think Carlos should know this. But you need to know this one because they grow on trees. <laughs> they grow on trees. Can you describe? Describe the one on the right. Describe the apical window. What's, what's funny about it? What's unusual? Can't hear you. You don't see the full diaster? Yes, you do. I mean, you have a, you have a cycle and a half for you, you know. What, what's unusual? I can tell you what's unusual, and this is always should be with you, okay? What's unusual is when the heart contracts normally, there is not only endocardial motion, but there is epicardial motion inward. So there is some contraction of the total body of the heart from the outside, okay? Some contraction from the outside. And you see that here, and you don't see this here. The heart is almost plastered. It's not going anywhere. As opposed to here and here. So the differential is not too big. It's either akinetic or there is no place for it to go. So it's either akinesia that I'm not seeing, you know, whatever it is, right? Or there's crowding, too much crowding, like what's called an apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You have no, you have, n you don't have much space for the heart to move. <laughs> Just about three millimeters. And you're not going to be able to move that from the epicardium. So usually it kind of stays as a cap and you have some thickening inside and that's what you see. And look at these very prominent also perforators hmm? that are not only the septal perforators, but the arteries become so large that you can actually image them emptying into the heart. Okay, now this is, I want you to tell me two of the phenomena that we talked about today in this collage. And, the hurri and this hurricane is because of? Because of? High mechanical index. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Somewhere there, I don't know. High. And what's the other one? What's the other phenomenon? Too much contrast up here. Very bright. Shadowing. In the same case. Right? So at times you, you do tricks. I prefer not to do the tricks is that if I inject too much contrast here, I crank up my mechanical index so I can destroy quite a bit of contrast and then bring it back, right? But, well, we don't need that, do we? Prefer not to. And you can enhance aortic stenosis jets. And I know uh, Eleonora and previously Dr. Margianis was working on this. But we know that if you enhance these, I can tell you from our experience in TR, tricuspid regurgitation jet, if you do it very early, you will bloom this, and it may be even half a meter per second. So you gotta be very careful of, of uh, when you do that. Okay, this is about a 20-year-old slide that I haven't changed. And the impact is still the same as was, we didn't have data at that time, and now we have data to tell us that indeed the impact is highest in stress echo and ICU, and in patients in general less, but the least, the least impact is in outpatients. This is an early study by Yong Ki Young. He's now in Corpus Christi, I think, about 15 plus years ago. 
looking at in the same, it, this is in our institution, technically very difficult patients coming in to the ICU. More than 50% of the heart not seen. Harmonic, contrast plus harmonic, right? And then TEE as a gold standard. So that's what you see here, fundamental, harmonic, plus contrast, and then transesophageal as your gold standard in the ICU setting. And indeed, if you use contrast plus harmonic compared to TEE, you can tell really the regional as well as global function much better. Uh, how about stress? If you're gonna use contrast with stress, better use it at all stages from rest all the way to exercise so it's easier for you to interpret, right? Once you load the heart with contrast, you need some topping off. You don't need to use as much, so you don't overall attenuate, so you'll make sure that you do that, and you'll go through your regular st routine, stress echocardiography, et cetera. Current utilization in the United States is very narrow. It's between zero and 100%. I mean, that's the truth. It's between zero and 100%, and it's really bad because it's all over the place. Actually, it's less utilization than more utilization. And we did a study, you probably know that, Juan Carlos Plana, when he was a fellow here a few years ago, it's like, my goodness, almost nine years now published, uh, did a study that I know will not duplicate again, is uh, two dobutamine stress echoes, randomized, one with contrast and one without. And uh, bottom line is you could see better, no question about it, at rest and during stress. And if you have more than two segments that you don't see, your accuracy of interpretation compared to cardiac catheterization goes down significantly. So, and I'll show you a case right here, a case in hand. On the left side, this is a stress echo non-contrast. You tell me how you're gonna interpret this stress echocardiogram, okay? I see an abnormality here, maybe in the apex. The others is very hard for me to tell. And if I use contrast here, it changes the whole diagnosis because at rest, there is an apical infarction to start with, right? And at 30 mics, uh, the whole heart balloons out. So you have tremendous ischemia with a previous infarction, which changes, you know, basically the whole interpretation. And I think it's very important. Now, a few things for you, I think it's important to keep in mind. Yes, contrast illuminates and increases your visualization of, uh, of the heart. However, it has issues, and you'd better know what the issues are. Once you start seeing linear formation, you know, the heart is not linear. You gotta be very careful, right? And watch this. See how linear this thing is? See how linear this thing is? This is a shadow from a papillary vessel, or any other structure that's giving you a linear density. Same thing here. Now, you wanna make sure also that you're not fooled so you can be fooled either way. One, if, if the images are good, don't use contrast. The re, if they're really good, don't use contrast. You're gonna have some attenuation, some issues. If the images are not good, I would use it, but with a caveat, make sure that you understand what you're dealing with. Meaning that in this patient here, believe it or not, there is a wall motion abnormality hiding right here. And your eye is fooled by thinking that this black linear density is actually where the endocardium is. You notice this? Notice where the wall motion is here. This is not here. So you gotta be very careful about that. So these are the general consideration. Yes, it improves the boreal delineation, uh, translate into improved accuracy. In our case, probably we use about 60 or 70% of these cases and you have to optimize these images. And last is, you know, what's the impact on, on clinical management, if you will. And that's a study that Mohammed Kurt, when he was here visiting from Turkey, did. And this is, what, seven years ago almost, eight years ago. Um, probably among the most cited um, outcome uh, measures from contrast. 632 individuals consecutive in this institution who required contrast because of technical difficulty. And what we did is actually, because you couldn't randomize them and very difficult to do, is we studied the non-contrast first, interpreted, and then added the interpretation of contrast, and asked the physician, called them up, 
gave them the interpretation of the non-contrast first and said, what would you like to do? You want to do something else or just stop there? And after they committed to whatever they wanted to do, we said, well, actually, we did a contrast. And on the contrast, it shows this and this and this. Would you change your mind or you still want to do it? And uh, I thought that was a clever way to do it. And, <laughs> and indeed, it helped because Obviously, the, Im the impact on quality was very good. On the left side is before and after contrast. Most of them were interpretable. There were some in the ICU which uh, were not as interpretable still. The impact of contrast on additionally planned procedure, the impact obviously was highest in the surgical ICU where instrumented patients were, up to almost you know, 60% or you know, 55% MICU less. And what we're talking about is TE avoided or nuclear imaging avoided and no procedural change, you know, very, the highest was in the outpatient setting because you needed contrast less actually, right? And medication change, hemodynamic drug started, hemodynamic drug stopped, anticoagulation started, anticoagulation stopped, and I think that was important. And this is the overall impact. And the overall impact, highest in the surgical intensive care unit, more than 60% followed by MICU, inpatient wards, and the impact's about 12% or so in the outpatient setting. And I asked, the, I asked the Kurt, said, well, why don't you run an analysis and said, well, is the impact incremental the more or the less we see, if you will? And indeed, I mean, it was beautiful there is that if I have two to six segments not seen, the impact is 14%. If it is more of a half of the heart and the whole heart, obviously, you have no interpretation. And I think overall safety is good. This uh, was from Dr. Dolan, who's actually now the uh, works with industry. Uh, there are many studies, and early on in the early days, there was concern about safety of contrast and so many other things. So gradually, many of these black box that were indicated for contrast, mostly for not using them in acute coronary syndromes, not use them with shunting, not using that, all of that is pretty much gone. And what is left is if you have allergy, basically, to the product itself, meaning that you had to have an exposure before, basically. So I'm going to stop here and ask any questions. And the other myocardial perfusion, believe it or not, there is a code. We don't do myocardial perfusion because, I mean, we've worked 15 years or so on, on research in it. And it is very variable. I think it's tricky. And that's why you don't see it as well. I mean, it's still in research purposes. It's beautiful research tool, particularly in a best setting of like an animal setting, et cetera, because you could do multiple injections in different hemodynamic situations. Therapeutics, so the other two are therapeutics is, is still very experimental. But myocardial perfusion, believe it or not, some of the investigators persuaded ASE and the American Medical Association to have a code. It's called a, forgot what the name of the code is, but basically to look at utilization of laboratories in the country, whether they're interpreting perfusion in addition to wall motion with contrast, and we'll see where that goes. That's usually the first step in case you want to get reimbursed. Do you want to see first utilization? And then, you know, people will decide whether to make it a reimbursable code. All right, any questions? Clear? Wonderful. Thanks for being here. <laughs>